Great. Thanks a lot uh, to uh, the uh, COVID Information Commons, uh, building the community. I'm happy to have an opportunity to share a little bit of our interests. Um, I think of this as a broad community that includes not only scientists, but uh, social scientists. So I've tried to put together a talk that will be understandable by all. all. The title is changed a little bit. Rather than ecological dynamics, I will focus on evolutionary dynamics of human coronaviruses and what one might be able to learn uh, from such processes that might actually inform how we think about new strategies for preventing future pandemics. So COVID-19 persists. Okay, this uh, is a little bit out of date, but this is from August, uh, 2024. So last month where there have been um, uh, over 7 million deaths globally. And um, at that time, there was some increase over the previous seven days. So people continue to be infected. And the cases also, at least in, in August uh, last month, they were increasing over the last uh, 28 days or so. So the numbers are certainly much lower than they were at the height of the pandemic. But we know uh, people are still getting infected. And we don't know what will be happening uh, during the, the coming uh, months or years. So why does it persist? Well, basically, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, continues to evolve. And I won't go into details. This was nicely reviewed in uh, last year. Essentially, if you look at this um, figure from uh, a timeline from uh, January 2020 out to December 2022, you see a bunch of different colors uh, appearing and disappearing uh, that are correlated with various strains of the virus. Uh, isolated from patients over this period. And essentially the virus is uh, being displaced. Various strains are being displaced by new strains that are uh, continuing to evolve. So uh, it persists because it evolves. And of course, we know that we have each gotten, uh, hopefully, uh, vaccinated at least once and in many cases, multiple times to protect ourselves. But we're be being protected against current or past strains and not necessarily future strains. Likewise, there are drugs that uh, have been developed to target specific virus functions, as well as um, uh, antibody uh, types of therapies. But again, these are targeting uh, uh, viruses as they've existed in the lab have been uh, demonstrated, but ha uh, can give rise to resistant viruses. So to better understand what's going on in these sorts of systems, I thought I'd just go back to some basic virology and uh, share a famous quote from some immunologists that a virus is simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein, where the bad news is the genome shown here schematically as this linear entity with various genes. Uh, that's the uh, genome for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that caused the pandemic. And when we say it's wrapped up in protein, then this genome is, um, is put into a nanoparticle, and the, the, the surface of this particle are the various spike proteins that the virus uses to enter cells. So um, this, uh, the, this particle then, when it encounters a susceptible uh, cell, whether it's in the brain or in the respiratory tract, uh, sends the bad news into the cell, and that bad news gets amplified into something we might call followers for the biologists. These are a message of the virus and proteins, and the followers of this bad news amplify the bad news, make more of it. They also package the bad news and make new virus particles, which are then released into the uh, to the world, uh, external world of the cell, and they can go and infect other cells. Uh, the news is bad because generally the cell that receives the bad news dies in this process of transforming a single virus into anywhere from 10 to 10,000 virus particles. So this is how bad news spreads. A byproduct of this process that is not widely appreciated is that uh, the bad news can also make what we could call fake news. So in addition to amplifying the bad news during a normal infection, a byproduct of this process is to make genomes that are defective, that are lacking essential information needed for replication. We call these genomes defective virus genomes, or in this case, fake news. 
they can also be packaged into particles and we call them zombie uh, virus particles. So in this case, a zombie virus particle is a piece of fake news wrapped up in protein. It's a byproduct of normal virus infection. Such particles have been known for over 50 years for virtually every virus, including coronaviruses, influenza viruses, dengue viruses, the list goes on and on. Why do we call them zombie viruses? Well, we know zombies are dead. And this is no exception. The zombie virus, when it encounters a cell, can release its fake news genome into the cell. But because it is lacking essential information for growth, it fails to turn the cell into a virus factory. In, generally, in general, the cell will not die. And this is the end of the line for this zombie virus. But I've chosen the term zombie virus, which you will not find in the broader literature other than a scientific American perspective article uh, that I wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, zombies we know can spring to life and this zombie virus can spring to life under special conditions. And that's in the case that the zombie virus encounters a cell that is infected by a intact virus. So the intact virus goes about its normal process of introducing the bad news, amplifying the bad news, making the followers. But what happens here is if the fake news is introduced by the zombie virus, the fake news can divert the resources of the normal virus infection toward its own amplification and the fake news can get amplified. Likewise, if the fake news re re retains the signals that say, hey, package me, then the fake news can be packaged into zombie virus particles. So what happens is one can get zombie virus reproducing at the expense of a normal virus. And again, this has been known for many viruses for many years. If you look at this figure and you forget about the zombie viruses and just look at the intact virus, you'll notice that one virus goes in and maybe a smaller number of viruses, intact viruses are produced, which is exactly the sort of um, behavior we would like to have for antiviral strategies, uh, therapeutics that reduce or inhibit normal virus growth. So this, is, uh, this idea has inspired many people to, to ask, could we create zombie viruses that are therapeutic? And a number of uh, groups have done that. Uh, these are not my own group, but zombie viruses have inspired the um, engineering of so-called therapeutic interfering particles. So uh, virus-like particles that can divert resources from the virus toward their own replication. Uh, those are a couple of prominent papers from uh, a couple of years ago. So um, I'd like to, I'll return to the zombie viruses, but I want to um, uh, show a special uh, case where uh, people were looking at SARS-CoV-2 evolution in Germany. And what I show here is a single patient at the center of here. I'm not sure, are you able to see my pointer or not? Yes, okay. So here's one patient who was in Freiburg, Germany, who was infected with SARS-CoV-2. We had a swab sample. This is from the paper that published uh, this work. They swabbed the, the person and they got the genetic sequence. And then they also tracked other people who were infected in Freiburg. And each one of these other dots represents another person in Freiburg who was uh, infected by a virus related to the initial one. And based on their swab samples and the sequence analyses, one can create this, uh, an, uh, this trajectory of evolution. So each of these individual dots are uh, swab sample sequences that are showing the further, or, uh, the further away you go from the center, the more evolutionary diversity, um, uh, genetic diversity you have on these uh, viruses. So this is showing evolution of the virus in Freiburg, Germany uh, during the early pandemic, 2020 or so. Each one of these dots is a single patient, single swab sample. What I now show is an additional evolution beyond that individual where there are additional swab samples were taken and in the red box, there are more uh, radiating outwards, so greater evolution. But what's unusual about this is this was from, from a single person and that person was immunocompromised. If you're getting your organ transplant, you'll get drugs to treat your, um, to downregulate or inhibit your immune response so you don't reject the organ. 
or if you're HIV positive, then your uh, the the uh, T cells that we heard in the first talk are going to be compromised, and they will be less able to fight the infection that you have, and you might be actually sick for several months or even over a year with your uh, virus infection. So this individual was sick for 120 uh, 140 days. And then uh, swab samples from this single individual indicated that the virus was evolving. It's hypothesized that such immunosuppressed individuals are sources for the uh, genetic diversity that we see uh, as uh, the um, coronavirus evolves. So when we saw this, we've spent a number of years looking at um, defective virus genomes, and we wondered whether or not uh, they might uh, actually be present in COVID patients, and particularly in the uh, 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 immunocompromised patients. So this immunocompromised patient, this is from the published work uh, from day zero to day 140. So this axis is time going from early to late, uh, 140 days. And then the, y uh, the x axis are various virus uh, variants. And they're, the higher the level they are, the darker the color. So there are a number of columns here. Uh, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or so columns where the, the strain that was parent, uh, present at day zero persisted all the way through. So that the, these are the vertical col columns here. But you will also see indications where new dots appear and disappear or persist over time. And these represent genetic variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So they are evolving in this particular patient. We went into the database for this particular patient and looked for specifically signs that maybe there could be some zombie viruses, so defective virus genomes that delete large sections of information. This is work of my PhD student, Nan Jiang, who uh, needed to learn the informatics from a collaborator, uh, Colin Dewey, but uh, eventually was able to create an analogous uh, plot. So here's day zero through day 140. And here are also various changes that are occurring. And all the x-axis represent various deletions uh, uh, um, that are uh, appearing and disappearing or persisting uh, over the course of uh, this immunocompromised patient's uh, infection. So we don't know what this really means yet, other than there's something that seems to be tagging along with the normal virus. There's evidence of these zombie-like virus, and they may, might be co-evolving. One, per, one perspective might be, we know that if you test positive for COVID, that your symptoms can range from, non, from asymptomatic or non-severe all the way to critical. And one perspective might be that if zombie viruses are prevalent at higher concentrations, then maybe they're inhibiting the normal virus and you're having a less severe disease. Whereas if you are testing positive and you have very little zombie virus, maybe they are not inhibiting the virus so well, so you're getting a more cr critical uh, kind of severity of disease. This is one hypothesis. But we've also looked at other immunocompromised patients as well as uh, patients who are um, under surveillance. We've looked at their zombie virus, uh, the defective virus genome frequencies, and uh, basically we've seen in some cases patients recover, the frequencies are a bit lower. Uh, in one case, so this is an N of one, uh, a patient died, a patient from the United Kingdom who was immunocompromised, and they happen to have higher levels of defective virus genome frequencies. Uh, so um, this at least shows that it's possible that they could be perhaps not protective, but maybe could be correlated with more severe disease. We don't know what uh, what uh, this really means at this point, but um, this opens a number of questions. So one is how are virus-like genomes or these defective virus genomes, how are the zombie viruses uh, linked to disease severity? We've suggested they could be causing more severe disease or less severe disease. We'd like to better understand how these defective virus genomes or zombie viruses function. How do they interact with the resources of the normal infected cell or during co-infections? How do they activate immune responses, either innate or adaptive immune responses? Ultimately, are there design rules that we could uh, uh, figure out from studying these beneficial defective virus genomes? So I've hinted towards the idea that they might be 
helping us provide, um, prevent future pandemics. We have currently drugs and vaccines that interfere with normal virus growth and activate protective immune responses. And a claim here is that these therapeutic interfering particles can do the same, but they also offer additional possibilities. One is that they amplify by preying on infected cells. Currently, there are no drugs or vaccines that amplify themselves in the presence of the disease. So that's potential interesting feature of therapeutic interfering particles. Therapeutic interfering particles, since they are virus-like, can also transmit between hosts just like viruses do. So currently, drugs and vaccines do not transmit between hosts. So if you're an anti-vaxxer, it's conceivable that you could receive protection from someone who has been inoculated with a therapeutic interfering particle. Therapeutic interfering particles also have the possibility of resisting virus escape. Viruses escape current vaccines and drugs because they create genetic variation that can allow them to resist uh, the effects of drugs. But therapeutic interfering particles use the same error-prone machinery that the virus uses. So they have the possibility of co-evolving with the virus. And there is actually work uh, very old work that we are working to reproduce in which therapeutic interfering particles and viruses can be co-evolving. So if we think about the powerful new features of therapeutic interfering particles, we have to also recognize that there will be new risks and this opens new ethical questions. So I think it's important for us to be aware of these sorts of questions that also arise. I have a number of uh, great collaborators. I just want to uh, highlight here, in particular, Colin Dewey from Biostatistics and Medical Informatics, who's played a central role in, uh, in uh, helping and my graduate student come up to speed on the bioinformatics. We also have people in the medical school and people working with immunocompromised hamsters and evolutionary biologists who are helping us. So that concludes my talk. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Feel free to take a look at our website or contact me uh, if I'm not able to get your questions uh, during today's session. Thanks a lot.